like to call them my Cajun Von Trop family. Hello, I'm Mark Johnson. Tonight we have a special edition of Farley Hall, special in length and content. For tonight, we're devoting all 30 minutes to one subject, or rather one family who's made a difference in their small community, made a difference with their love and caring, as well as their cooking and caroling. Some call them the Cajun Von Trapp family, but they call themselves the Dusenberries. And tonight, producer Valerie Chin takes us on a drive south for the sights and sounds of a unique Cajun clan. The L in Louisiana could stand for life. The state is a blend of the banal and the buoyant. In the swamps and bayous, it flaps, flies, glides, and swims along at a pace as slow as it is beautiful. But in its cities, life picks up a bit of speed and sound. Loud at that. New Orleans is the TR of the state's collection of jeweled cities. Historic and hysteric. Clouds of Dixieland hover above the native artists and tourists as they perform their respective duties. One paints, the other buys, all in the shadow of St. Peter's Cathedral. But this isn't a story about the quaintness of the quarter or the courage of the square Saint General Andrew Jackson. It's a story about a woman who also has been immortalized with a statue. But hers is not weathered in animate bronze. No, her statue is the Hosanna of song. This is Homer Terrebonne Parish, a small city of 15,000 people stuffed in the toe of Louisiana's boot-like design. It's a city in love with water. Bayou sliced the town into a puzzle. It's also a place that survives on tourism. Unemployment floats around 15%. But it's also a city that believes in the strength of its people, where you have to work hard for your livelihood. That's just what Wilma Dusenberry does and why she shops for groceries on Saturday morning. But this is no ordinary Saturday morning shopping. Wilma is picking out the products and produce for tomorrow, the big meal of the month for her family in more ways than one. For tomorrow is what the Dusenberries call First Sunday, and you can be sure that the cash register won't be the only one singing then. Everything has to be just right. So Wilmer starts the meal on Saturday afternoon. These are the first preparations for the first Sunday meal. The onions are peeled, the peppers are polished, and the water redded. As Wilma and daughter number four Veronica move through this monthly ritual. The rest of the family shows up tomorrow, not to eat, but to help heap out these delightful Dusenberry delicacies. For this isn't just a big meal, and it isn't just the first Sunday of the month. This is La Trouvaille. This is the Dusenberry's restaurant home, away from home. 
And this is first Sunday, when the family greets, seats, and eats with anyone who cares to drop in on their 55-seat restaurant. It's not really a restaurant. You would say it's a, because you come in and there's only one thing to eat. You know, if you don't eat that, well, you're out of luck, you know. And that's really so. For the homemade meal isn't the only magnet that draws tourists to this tiny bayou town. The main attraction that makes the dozen bearers more than just to run off the mill 47 member Cajun Catholic band is that this family plays and sings with your supper. Music and food are cores of the Cajun culture. And if there is one thing true about the Rosen Berries, it's that they are very Cajun and proud of it. So, in 1979, Jean and Wilma decided to bring the special sights, sounds and smells to the world, or at least that part who stumbled into La Trouvaille, just the way the Dozen Berries did when they found it. The whole process was a finding. We found the old house. We found uh, the dishes, we found the old tables, we found everything. And through by means a lucky find, it means a godsend. But this wooden diamond they found was truly rough. The house needed work before it could become the restaurant of their dreams. La Trouvaille needed uh, la transformation. And Wilma and Jean knew just where to turn in this time of need, the family. In the beginning, the way La Trouvaille got together was because of all the son-in-laws. Uh, every weekend, we'd go down the by to the old house, and they would come and use their brain and their brawn, and they would uh, fix and patch and paint and uh, do everything. For Though the men worked to reinforce La Trouvaille, the real architects of the structure are the dozen very women, especially on first Sundays. They cook, serve, and clean up after the meals, but all that is put on the back burner when the dozen very women take center stage, or center floor in this case, and sing to the patrons their sweet Cajun folk songs. <laughs> Their sound is pristine and never a singing lesson for any of the family. Raising 12 kids in the 1950s, they couldn't afford it. In fact, they couldn't afford much, especially entertainment for the kids. So they entertained themselves. They would always sing at home. In fact, no, I would not allow them out of the yard. <laughs> we had a lock on the gate and everybody stayed inside the yard because I could never, I always said, I couldn't imagine sending 12 children over to the neighbors. You know, can you imagine what would happen? 
So they we stayed. Had a in the yard. They right. stayed in the yard. They act. They amused themselves. They played games. They sang. They put on little shows. When they were all little, uh, I wrote this song. I had no idea they would grow up and sing. Y'all really didn't know that. And I rock. I really, really, y'all. I didn't do anything else but rock, rock babies, <laughs> change diapers, and make bows. And so I'd sing songs. And I, I wrote this song for. It's called the Cajun Lullaby. The musical roots of the family run deep. Not only did Wilma love to sing and write songs, but Jean fed his 14-member choir by managing a music store. But a musical future was not the reason for such a large family, as much as religion was. My reasons for having a large family was because of what the church taught. The, the church said, uh, you know, that uh, at, at least what I thought the church had taught, the idea I got was that you would go to hell if you would uh, practice birth control. <laughs> so I didn't want to go to hell. That was the first thing I decided. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't, you know, so I thought, well, this was it. I was going to make my way to heaven. But I found out that having a lot of children was, you could also pave your way to the other place real easy, you know, after you had them. And sometimes it seemed like hell, or at least financial hell for the young family. For as they kept growing, the money kept going while Jean tried to keep them afloat. At that time, of course, then $333 a month was a lot of money. It was a pretty good salary. It was more than what, but not But it just know, wasn't enough for 14 people. For 14 people. So, this large family in such a small town stood faced with giant problems how to feed and clothe 14 folks. But that's when the community rallied around the dozen berries, led by Wilma's aunt, Rosadell. My aunt had, uh, had she, uh, without us knowing, had gone to a lot of people in town, and uh, she had asked them to help us. She called it a Project Happiness. And um, it was right after Louis and Marie were born. And uh, we went, she invited me to her house, me and Jean, to the, the family to the house. And there were all these people, and they had paid all kind of bills for us. They'd gotten us a new refrigerator. They had stocked us up with food for, I think, uh, two or three months. So the family survived and began to thrive, yet still had no way to thank those who helped them through those desperate times. That was until one December day when Wilma's aunt heard the children singing. It was the answer to all their prayers. And Rosadell heard him singing. And this was in 1964. And uh, it was Christmas 1964. And I had told, uh, we were visiting, and I was telling her how I wished that we had gifts to give to all these people that were so kind. I said, I suggested to her that, that they have the gift of song that they could give to people who would, had been good to them. She would just bring us a knock on the door, and she'd say, um, uh, when they come, she'd say, this is Wilma and Jean's family Christmas present. And she'd turn to the kids, and she'd say, 
sing, sing, sing. And they would sing and a Christmas carols. And that's how it all began. For nearly 25 years, the sweet sounds of the dozen varied voices have filled the ears of their friends from home, and it's brought them attention that they never dreamed they'd receive. From talent shows to recording sessions to even now a brand new La Trouvaille cookbook, fame hasn't complicated their lives at all. In fact, the people that know them best, like former Homer mayor Edward Lyon says, no matter what the temptations, money is not the root of the Duesenberry philosophy. It's the riches are in their lives as they know it, not the millions that they could have attained in dollars. And Wilma's longtime friend and cookbook publisher, Del Morris, says that the family is more important than expanding La Trouvaille into the restaurant gold mine. Many believe it can be. She could go um, make it very much more popular and famous and this sort of thing, but that's not what she wants. She's happy when she's at La Trouvaille. She's happy being herself and doing her thing the way it is. The Duesenberries run La Trouvaille almost as a hobby. They make money, but not a lot. They feel the experience they give visitors is the real reward. But as little money as they make from performing, 
Their singing has taken them places they couldn't have afforded to go to, and they've paid with their gift of song. We sang for our supper right. every night. Literally. We sang really for a place to sleep and eat. We did a concert every day till we got to California and also on the way back. Then while we were there, we were invited to sing at Disneyland. Yeah, so and that was that wonderful. Was a, an experience. And then they gave us tickets, you know, to, uh, to ride. To, yeah. No money was exchanged, but food and the tickets. Food and, and, yeah. uh, and ride. So really, and money has not been the exchange. It's been the, oh, marvelous experiences of our music. Our music has really uh, broadened our, uh, you know, our horizons. One of the places that they visited was a realization of Wilma's lifelong dream. She had always wanted to visit France and their heritage, but could never afford it. In 1983, the Homer community pitched in and helped send the Dusenberries on that dream trip, one that's brought them a lot of memories as well as many French visitors who saw them perform while overseas. La Trouvaille is a special place run by special people, and those who enter seem enraptured by the magic that is the dozen berries. Oh, Jared, I'm so glad you could oh, come. Was I'm glad oh. you could come here. You were so was sweet great. and so good. Nice yeah, and the the feelings are good. It was real touching, very pretty. Whatever it may be, their singing, the food, or their love of people, when visitors leave La Trouvaille, they can't help but take some of that magic with them. Magic that they can never exercise from their souls. Some people are kind of a little uptight or whatever. But when they come here, they, 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 there's, a, there's a transformation. When they leave here, everyone is shaking hands and waving goodbye and giving each other addresses and that sort of thing. And it's one lady, I guess she told me what, what, it, uh, what it really is. She said, coming down here is like going to grandma's uh, for Sunday dinner. And I think it's that sort of atmosphere. And it's, it, the main thing, it's genuine, it's, it's real. And it, because of Wilma and, and her, her fine family. They had to share with each other. They didn't have any money. And they had to share with each other their love and um, 
to make their lives get along. And uh, it, it, it just really brought something special to them. And especially in their music, their singing, they give this uh, harmony to other people. I mean, they have a harmony in their own lives, and they, try, they impart this to the people around them, which I think is very special. He just <laughs> took whatever day came, whatever, you know, and uh, we got up to here. And uh, I think that's, like I said, somebody bigger than us who kept us alive, kept us surviving until we could begin to what, what I consider live, you know. The joy of living, it's, it's, we've come to the joy of living now, especially for me. Oh. I really hope for them is that they uh, can learn to be strong within themselves that if they don't have that that uh, they'll find life wonderful anyway you know in in whichever form you know family life they have uh, I think sometimes it takes one person where it centers around. But I'm sure that one of the children will take our place. In other words, there'll always be a meeting place. There'll always be a, and hopefully it will continue. We hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Farley Hall. Be sure to tune in May 2nd at the same time for more informative reports from the University of Mississippi Journalism Department. We leave you now with more from our Cajun friends.
And they called it paradise. And we still call it paradise. And that's why we're working so hard not to win good. Because it is a paradise. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a beautiful poem and introduced everybody to the, uh, the, the Acadian story a long time ago. And we're going to sing a song now that salutes the young girl that he wrote about in his poem. And he called her Evangeline, and we call her Evangeline. Turn this way. Come here. Come here. Thank you. Oh, 
Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Shay Vangeline, she came and she waited a long time for Gabrielle, only never to find you. Matter of fact, she found it, but it was mad to somebody else. Well, not everybody. Shay got lost or separated like they, like Evangeline and Gabrielle. Uh, a lot of Cajuns came, found sweethearts and married them. And the song we're going to sing uh, is about a man who found somebody, had 21 kids, and uh, he knew what to do. He fed him a filet gumbo. <laughs> After he, <laughs> he fed him a filet gumbo, and he played every Saturday night the Faye Dodo, and his name was Papa Thibodeau. Oh, would y'all come up a little bit closer? We'd be more comfortable. Y'all come on. Y'all come on. grandchildren and it's a good it, time to introduce y'all to the family now since we sang about Papa Thibodeau has 21. Well we didn't have 20 well we had 12 children and they were all born at 11 years and uh, when our sixth child was a year old we had a set of twins and when those twins were a year old we had another set of twins and when those twins were almost two we had another set of twins. And so they arrived and uh, they all grew up. <laughs> They have families of their own. We have 17 grandchildren, and it's just one. And there's some, some of these, some are here no, today. Oh, and we'll Gina just in. came in. And James. <laughs> James and James. So I'll let the family introduce themselves, starting from this end. Okay. I'm Rosie. I'm number three. <laughs> my son is here. Oh, and my son John is here. John. Okay. John. Raise your hand, John. One of her okay. children fighting in the corner. <laughs> I'm number one, y'all. Yeah. I'm Jean Allen. Yeah. My, one of my children's here, James. James. Hey. 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 I'm number seven. I was part of the second half. I have a twin sister. My name is Margaret. My twin sister is Monica, but she's not here today. Shannon. And I don't have any children. <laughs> I'm Veronica. I was the fourth child. This is my second of three girls right here. This is Jeannie. I'm Cindy. I'm number five. I have a daughter, Dana. She's not here today. I'm number nine. My twin sister's Annette. She just had a baby. She's number ten. But this is uh, my youngest of two daughters. This is Jenny. Michelle's at home sick. Oh, <laughs> and these are the children of jo our son John. This is Kimberly and Stephanie. John was killed in 1978, and uh, they've grown up beautiful. They they have a new little baby sister. They have a wonderful dad. His name is Dave. And I'm so happy that y'all could be here today. Yeah. They don't come with us. They, they visit us all, but they not enough to hear all these songs over and over and over again. So y'all hearing them today? Yeah, yeah. And uh, then, of course, y'all, I'll 
there's, let's see, Timmy's not here. He was the second one born. Uh, and we'll wait. Oh, okay, down. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, Aunt Marie and Uncle Louis and Ida, that was the last twin, the girl and the boy. I think that's it. Jenny Tulva. Okay, okay. Aunt Marie and Annette. Yeah, well, you said about Annette. Okay, Tim. How many boys? We had three boys. We have three boys. Uh, Timmy is... Timmy was the second, and then John was the sixth, and Louis was the eleventh. So they were spaced with all those girls. And they used to sing, y'all, but uh, th when they got in their teenage years, they said they got tired of people saying, thank you, girls. And so they <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, they don't sing with the now, our musicians, y'all, I just have to introduce y'all. Of course, Papa. Y'all got to know Papa. Papa. Raise your hand. <laughs> And dear Cookie, <laughs> dear Cookie, dear Cookie Domingue on the guitar, she Cookie has come into our lives about four or five years ago, and she's brightened it up. She she comes in. Uh, thank you, Cookie. Uh, <laughs> then uh, Ronnie feels on the guitar back there. Now Ronnie has He's come been on. through it all. Ronnie <laughs> was started out with the family, started singing in 1964. He was there. He's there. And he's got something to say about that, I believe. And he looks it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he's taken out for you. Said that? Oh, no, no. Said that? I said, I've been standing next to Papa so long. Look, he's rubbing off. <laughs> <laughs> rubbing off on me. And then our accordion and banjo player, Mr. Jimmy Southern. He, came, he has been with us for the last three or four years, too, and thank God for him. Jimmy is also a, he's, he's a man of many, many talents. He uh, plays, besides playing the accordion and the banjo, he's written three books. Two of them are here. He has a, a darn little cookbook, something red, something green, the bean, uh, the little Cajun dictionary, and uh, Last Style, huh? But that's out of print. Last Style's out of print. And uh, then our wonderful bio fiddler, Mr. Bobby Pellegrin, who comes and adds the Cajun cup to Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Oops. You want books later? Well, what we're going to do now is sing to y'all. Uh, what we're going to do now is a song for your little. Uh, oh, I have somebody very special to I almost forgot. My dear, two dear people that's here tonight. <laughs> Uh, when the children, we, I have, the family would not be singing if it wouldn't be for a certain lady that's here today, Aunt Rosadale, who is the one that encouraged them all. Aunt Rosadale. I've encouraged all of you could have been here one day. All of the children were singing 20 years ago. Absolutely, their voices were just as beautiful in a different way, in a simpler way than they are today. Beautiful, gorgeous voices. And I'll recognize them with God. No, no lesson, no formal lessons at all, not except Wilma taught them in her home. And I think uh, because of her boredom with having 12 children, being bored <laughs> all the time, <laughs> it was boredom, it's staying in, you know, and we all tried to encourage them. Yeah. And I recognize that this was a God given gift that they had because they had no formal lessons, and they have a harmony. I heard on TV the other day there was a, a musician, of, um, oh, an educator, a music educator, a man, who said that when, a, when voices are blended in one family rather than uh, other families, you know, together, that they are much a part of, the, the harmony is much more beautiful, and I see it in these people. And I've seen it all these years, and I just can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> well, April, thank you. April Dale suggested that we give a song as a gift uh, when... With, in 1964, the family uh, didn't have, we had a lot of kids, no money. And so many people, y'all, it took the whole city, all, my family and Jean's family, to help us. And so, uh, and the whole community, neighbors, churches. One time, even the Air Force, y'all, came when it was stationed there. They came and they helped us. And uh, Abe Rosadell suggested, when I said we didn't have anything to give, she said, well, I suggest you go and you give a song. 
So she drove us all over town. We went in 1948 Plymouth. <coughs> and, drove and then her car, and she'd knock on the door. And when the people would come, she'd say, this is Wilma and Jean's Christmas present. And then she'd turn to the kids and she'd say, sing, sing. And they would sing, and that's how we got started. And then on the other side of the family, if it wouldn't have been for this lady, Jean's <coughs> sister, Marie Johnson, stand up, Marie. Nanny. Hey. Without her and Jean's mama, and uh, without her helping us through this, y'all, they all these people helped us to, to survive, so we could do this for y'all today. <laughs> We're so alive today, and uh, I want Nanny. Got Thanks, something? Nanny. Thank well, you. I remember vividly the night when all the twelve were in that little two-bedroom home, okay? and Mother was in the back room, and she had six, and the oldest one was seven. And I had six in the nursery in that other bedroom in front. There was a set two, a set one, and a set 12 days. And the mother had gone back to the hospital because of complications on it. And mother would holler to me during the night, count your six in there. <laughs> 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 I said, I don't do babies. <laughs> but I found out I do babies. Right? I get up and I rock me to it. Two o'clock in the morning, you know, and I give her the bottle. And so it's really wonderful. And the baby falls asleep like that. Yeah, okay. When they were all little, uh, I wrote this song. I had no idea they would grow up and sing, y'all. I really didn't know that. And I'd rock. I really, really, y'all, I didn't do anything else but rock. Rock babies, <laughs> change diapers and make bottles. And so I'd sing songs. And I'd, I wrote this song for it's called The Cajun Lullaby. Oh, 
representing the tourist commission here, Miss Betty Reed. Yeah, Miss Betty. She talks about Terrebonne to everybody who wants to listen, you know, and so we're going to do it for her today. Uh, we're going to sing this song. It tells you all about Terrebonne Parish. Uh, we left our Bayou Large and I think Bayou Cane and uh, a few Bayous, but uh, we we'll almost said we have to throw those in there. Uh, uh, and it tells what, what, what we do, what fun we have, and what we eat, and it's called Love That Cajun Man, you know. And it was written by a man from Arkansas. <laughs> but you see, he liked it so much, he came down and wrote a song about it. Y'all ready? One, two, three, four.
I want to tell you that man came to my house and brought that song to me. He was on his way to Okinawa when he said his name was uh, Colonel Paul Towery. And he said, I heard you folks sing. And he says, I'm bringing you this song. And he says, do what you want with it. We've never recorded it yet, but hopefully one day we'll get to record it. And uh, he did come down to La Chubai and hear us sing it. So I think he did a wonderful job on that song about this area. And now what we're going to do is the blues of Louisiana, north, south, east, and west. And any of the songs, any of these songs that you know, please join in and sing with us too, okay? <laughs>
Beautiful food. Thank you. Thank you very much. They saved the best for last. <laughs> Thank y'all, friends. Thank y'all very much for coming. Here's Wilma again, because I'm liable to tell y'all a Cajun joke. <laughs> Yeah, we want to thank you all for coming to La Chivai. Uh, y'all made us happy today. And uh, we hope that uh, y'all had a good time. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. We have a request for the Star Spangled Band in French. Okay. Uh, okay. Y'all don't need to reach out Jenny. Jenny, you know it. Anyway, uh, I, I don't think we, we call this the official star track now. Uh, it's, uh, we call it La Bagnia et Toilet.
We might not be good, but we loud. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go they blow on you.